Welcome to another episode of Drew Pavel's Bolt Cutter. I'm joined with, I, I'm joined by senior lecturer at Monash University in Chinese Studies, Mr. Kevin Carico, also known by the um, pseudonym Kevin Carico, and we can discuss the, <laughs> we can discuss the pseudonym. And I'm also joined with my friend Max Max Mock, uh, who was himself a uh, uh, part of the Hong Kong uprising, and we're we're going to be discussing. Um, Kevin's great work on Hong Kong nationalism, Hong Kong independence. He's one of the few academics around who are willing to actually go on the record and say, I support Hong Kong independence. And this is ordinarily viewed as this, oh, this, this red line in the sand, this, you, you are anathema if you, are, if, you, if you embrace this cause. And Kevin has, um, has gone to personal risk to actually, you know, write the first, it's basically the first English standard text on Hong Kong nationalism. So um, we've got his book. Um, oh, oh, yeah, just, so, well, don't worry, we'll just cut out the gap. But, um, <laughs> but do you want to hold it up, Kim? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So this is the book, Two Countries, Two Systems. Um, it's been a great read for me and, and Max, particularly, Max has <laughs> told me he really likes it because it's, you said, right, Max, um, you should say, like, I mean, you th- felt it was the first kind of English standard text that kind of... Um, Expressed. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, you know, I went to bookstores in Australia and you get a whole Hong Kong and China section. And I don't want to criticize any author or books, but I would just say that, you know, rarely do they actually investigate Hong Kong nationalism as a concept. Yeah. Hong Kong independence. And it's almost taken for granted that, you know, the Hong Kong political situation is just over generalized. Everybody supports just the fair concept of democracy when, you know, when, if you think about it, that's just not possible, you know. When, yeah. You know, there are no divisions, there are no ideological differences, everybody just sort of subscribes to the concept of democracy, you know. So yeah. I think, to my knowledge, this is the first English text. There have been other texts in Chinese, yeah. you know, definitely, and yeah. Cantonese talking about Ch- Hong Kong nationalism and yeah. independence and factional differences. But yeah. I think to really go deep into these factions and tell each other apart as well, which this book does. I think it's the first English text and it's really worth a read, I think. Yeah, amazing. So, Kevin, can you explain, like, how did you first get into, um, you know, studying China and studying Hong Kong? I mean, you started off as a China researcher, correct? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I lived in China from yeah. uh, 2002 to 2007. Yeah. I worked there uh, for a number of years as a, a translator, actually. Okay. Where did you um, live and work? Uh, I was living in Shanghai at oh, the okay. time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, I've had, you know, had a nice enough time. But uh, translation was not really my thing. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, it's fun at first. Uh, I guess it pays well. Yeah. But then after a little while, um, essentially whatever anybody hands to you, you need to translate. And, yeah. Um, it gets kind of boring. Yeah. So I thought to myself, well, you know, I'm able to read, you know, able to speak, and I'd like to be able to use, you know, those skills to do something somewhat more interesting. Yeah. Uh, which is why I, I went back to graduate school uh, in the United States, became an anthropologist. Yeah. Did some research on um, Han nationalism in China. That was my uh, and you are um, my first book. You taught. Well, so you, this is something that uh, they will try and say, say proves Kevin's a, a CIA agent, but you taught Salih Hudaydah, one of the uh, East Turkestan oh, yeah. advocates, right, at some yeah. point? Um, when yeah. was that? Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that was during a postdoc at uh, University of Oklahoma. Yeah, right? so... Um, uh, back in the day, what, uh, 2013, 2014. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so his group is one of the Uyghur advocacy groups that they've formed their own kind of Uyghur government in exile and... I guess the fact that you taught him proves your CIA connection. So it's very interesting. Um, and, and you've just, in, in general, you have been a black hander behind the protest movement, correct? I mean, you went to Hong Kong and um, they had people follow you, correct? Is this, and this is the source of the great nickname, Cohen Kariko. Can you tell us yeah. a bit about this story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, um, you know, I was conducting my research in Hong Kong after deciding that, you know, I can't go to China anymore. Yeah. I so, had, what year was it? What year did, was it that you felt you couldn't go to China anymore? 
Well, I translated a, a book about uh, self-immolation in Tibet. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, that came out uh, in, I believe, 2015, um, called uh, Tibet on Fire, Self-Immolations yes. wow. Against Chinese Rule. And I had actually, uh, you know, for a long time, been extremely interested in Hong Kong. Um, I had actually wanted to write my uh, dissertation, like uh, my thesis, I guess we say in Australia, um, mm. about uh, national education in Hong Kong, which yeah. is like sort of patriotic education. But, Interesting, because uh, Max says that was basically his like kind of political awakening in Hong mm. Kong, the national education movement, mm. 2012, right, Max? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But I was eventually persuaded out of that uh, right. by um, people in my program who said that, well, if you write your dissertation about Hong Kong, basically you can only work in Hong Kong because you right. know, most universities aren't hiring Hong Kong specialists, especially 10 years ago. Uh, so considering that, I, I did do uh, my dissertation research in, in China. And then after establishing myself, uh, was happy to... Uh, you know, finally be able to to work in Hong Kong. Um, now, uh, that was exciting, but uh, after a little while, meeting with uh, people who uh, may be considered, you know, somewhat politically controversial, <laughs> uh, people who are, you know, followed by the, uh, you know, utter scumbag uh, Beijing media in Hong Kong, I also uh, ended up getting followed uh, by these same people. Yeah. And um, that was a surprise, you know. Um, I'm far less interesting than uh, Wen Hui Bao and Da Gong Bao think I am. Uh, I think you yeah. guys can probably... No, I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> I think... <laughs> but we're interviewing you because we... No, we're interviewing you because we think you're interesting, but... Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't agree. Yeah. You can get a lot of activists, but it's very hard for someone to uh, articulate themselves. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and <laughs> with me and Drew, it's very hard. <laughs> yes, like, yes. It took Drew... It's, it's been taking Drew three years just to write a book. Yeah. <laughs> no, I haven't even started. I think I've got like half a chapter. Yeah. And Kevin brought this over, brought two of his uh, features yeah. over. So yeah. I think uh, <laughs> we need people like him. A lot. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> well, well you're, you're creating the, you know, we need uh, more black hands behind the protest movement yeah. in Hong Kong. So, so uh, just <laughs> explain to us, like, so you were in Hong Kong and, and you just, how did you notice you were being followed? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I, I rode, uh, I rode a train out to. Um, yeah, why can I never remember the location of the train ride? But it was uh, the place where there's a mall and there's also like a uh, little uh, cable car that goes up to the top. Uh, Is it Dongming? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I always confuse, like... Uh, yeah, the cable car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. the big Dong statue. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So I, I took a train out there, and, you know, there's this lady looking at me on the train. Looking at you on the train, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, <laughs> this doesn't happen very often, right? <laughs> I, I think you wrote in your book, um, yeah. you were wearing board shorts and a shirt, and you felt it, it possibly wasn't because of your, um, yeah, your yeah, sartorial yeah. kind of yeah, elegance. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm thinking, you know, it's probably not because she has the hots for me. So, so why, <laughs> is she, why is she looking at me? Um, and I thought, well, you know, a million possibilities kind of race through your mind, you know. Um, and then you think, ah, well, it's just a coincidence. And then I walk around this mall, you know. I go to Starbucks. I go to just all kinds of stores. Just not doing anything politically subversive. Just being a lazy person who just <laughs> wants to walk around a mall, right? And everywhere I turn, you know, this lady's behind me. And that's when I realized, <laughs> wow. oh, okay, this is kind of weird. So uh, I also went down to the uh, the bathroom, right, uh, which is in sort of a basement area of the mall at one far end. And when I came out of the men's room, you know, this lady's also just waiting outside the bathroom. <laughs> and so, you know, It's very I mean, weird. Yeah, 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 you know. I mean, I know the people who run uh, 
Beijing controlled media in Hong Kong. I mean, obviously, to do that job, they have to not be very smart. <laughs> yes, but, yes, exactly. Yes. But I mean, this lady, <laughs> she was just. Uh, <laughs> She was just not the sharpest pencil in the box. Yeah, well, to, to I would have expected more from the MSA. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So we, then, yeah. you know, so then I was like, okay, this, this person's obviously following me. <laughs> I rode the escalator up <clears throat> from the bathroom. Yeah. And I thought, oh, I'll take a picture of her. You yeah, know? yeah. One thing she did do well was avoid... Me taking a picture of her. I'm like, I'll give her credit for that, right? Yeah. Because also, I'm a little nervous. You know, oh my gosh, somebody's following me. I, you know. Yeah. It doesn't happen often. I get jittery. Um, and so the one time that I was actually in control enough was to sort of take a picture of her as she's coming up the escalator. But when I held my phone, she literally rode the escalator backwards. <laughs> Wow. So like when she saw me holding up, <laughs> when she s- saw me holding up my phone, she literally turns 180 degrees, <laughs> you know, and rides the escalator like this. <laughs> and uh, I mean, very yeah. natural, very yeah, natural. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, also uh, in addition to being stupid, also a complete coward, right? Obviously, yeah, yeah. Because you of know course. she's following me. People are following me. Yeah. But then, uh, yeah. And, and what what was their kind of purpose for following you? That's what I couldn't figure out. I mean, did you you, know, they uh, wanted you to know? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, well, I, I mean, it, it's so difficult, right? It's yeah. To, to decipher these things. Why do but, they do because, what they do? Yeah, yeah. Because that was the only time that I could tell that someone was following me. Yeah. But there were other times, like when I met with people during the week, you know, we'd meet at a restaurant and there would be people who came in and just sat by themselves a few tables over from us. Mm. And I was like, this is a little sketchy, but at the same time, maybe I'm just being paranoid, you know? But later, um, when I came back to Sydney, uh, the morning, you know, after I flew out, Wen Hui Bao published a big sort of so-called expose (laughs) on me. Um, And then I could see from the photos that when I felt at various moments like, oh, maybe somebody following me. There were indeed, yeah. Wow, yeah, people and me. and um, it was a front page, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, the, and the entire front page. Yeah, and they called you Kevin Creek. Was that? Well, know, how did that happen? <laughs> how did that happen? Oh yeah, yeah. That, that's that, that, those are actually two separate, somewhat separate. Oh, okay, uh, yes. incidents. But okay, yes. But yeah, yeah. Uh, one way about did I mean uh, get my name right? The, okay, uh, that time yeah. they got it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was about nine months later. Uh, I did an interview with CNN about uh, essentially the Uyghur genocide, yes. right? And, and CNN, another black hand yeah, behind the... Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. And um, also the role, the, the issue uh, with sort of hand supremacy, mm-hmm. hand clothing, um, and uh, various issues related to, to my first book. And that... Yeah, which is on hand food, right? I mean... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And that got uh, that got people very angry. Um, yeah. And for some um, reason, that's a really touchy one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so at that point, um, there's some horrible website in Shanghai. I think it's called Guancha, right? Like Observe. Yeah. Yeah. Observe. Observe. China. I think it's funded by Eric X Lee. Who's Eric X Lee? Uh, he's I probably have the fortune of, of not knowing he's this guy. Some sort of uh, capitalist who also enjoys sort of. Ah, oh, beautiful. You know, simping for the CCP. Oh, there, there are a lot of people like that, so <laughs> yeah, good on them. Yeah, yeah. And um, it came down from Guancha all the way into um, local, so-called local media organizations like Sydney Daily, Melbourne Daily, oh, yes. which are, you know... This is very interesting. Basically because channels of CCP propaganda here in Australia. It is very interesting because I believe it is Sydney Daily... Mm. Well, I, I, am I correct? Sydney Daily is the one that Jason Yatsen Lee's business partner was the editor of. I think I've heard of that. Yeah. I'll, I'll if it's not true, I'll take it out of the podcast. But yeah. <laughs> but um, I remember Jason Yatsen Lee, the Labor MP. But no, in even Strasfield. besides Jason Yatsen Lee, I think during the federal election, the previous two federal elections, Sydney Morning, sorry, it's not Morning Herald, Sydney, Sydney Daily, Daily. <laughs> Sydney, Daily. <laughs> Sydney Daily, and Melbourne Daily, these Chinese language newspapers in Australia, yeah. they have been pushing for 
candidates that are somewhat murky on the China issue. Yes. Like they have full ads and really just cringeworthy ads. Like, mm-hmm. we're very proud of, uh, like, um, I can't name them, but... Like so, Gladys? So candidate. No, no. no uh, saying, oh, how can one person be so charming and all that? <laughs> just the most cringeworthy ads trying to push the propaganda on them. Actually, can we ask Jamie? Jay- Jay- <laughs> Chris, Jamie, <laughs> can you quickly uh, find out who what the teal candidate for Bradfield was? Because I remember, that was her. It was her. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. They, and there was some very interesting fucking so I'm things. Not surprised it leaked down. I remember. Um, I remember Sydney Daily when we did that first protest at UQ. They were the ones that like they had obviously had people. There were people in that crowd obviously who weren't students and they were taking photos of all the participants and mm-hmm. they were putting them up on the Sydney Daily website going, "These are the separatists who led the mm-hmm. anti-China yeah. rally at UQ." And like people, people got. There was a Chinese student at UQ. Um, not only did his parents get visited by what I believe must have been Ministry of State Security within like 24, 48 hours of being photographed at that protest. They also had, for some, somehow, they had photos of his driver's license, they had photos of his marriage certificate, photos of his passport, his Australian, certi- Australian citizenship certificate, all this stuff, and they put it up online with his address and were like, this wasn't Sydney Daily, but, but based on the photos that were in Sydney Daily, like identifying him, someone got all this personal information, doxed him, put it up on, it, on the internet, Chinese internet, mm-hmm. This is blah blah blah. We will never let him rest safely in Brisbane. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. So so. Uh, so yeah, it's it was, Kevin Carico. It was, uh, I believe, Sydney Daily and Melbourne Daily who referred to me as Cohen Corico. <laughs> so they spelled it out. Yeah, yeah. K E W I N C O R R I C O. Yeah, Cohen. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I always want to say to the people who work for Melbourne Daily, Sydney Daily, you know, stop. Harassing me, stop bothering me. Work on your English. You're here, right? It's a great opportunity yeah. to learn a new language, right? <laughs> right? There's nobody named Cohen. Cohen, but you know what the the horrible thing is? Like some CCP, because they have people who like they go through every second, single second of the stuff I put up. Mm. Like they, someone will clip that up and be like. Ke- Kevin Carico like launches racist attack on Chinese Australians. Like, I, I mean, it's interesting. Um, like, like, what, at what point did you feel like, what, what, what kind of made you an opponent of the CCP? When did you become, like, almost like kind of distant type? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a good question because I, uh, you know, I I went to China, well, about twenty years ago, yeah, and I was very naive. You yeah. know, I thought like, oh well, you know. Different countries have different cultures, you know. Maybe uh, this is the Chinese model, you know. Oh, that's what they like to say, the Chinese Communist Party. That's one of their... I I thought I was being culturally sensitive, right? Yeah, this is one of their standard defenses, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then living in China, you know, I gradually came to realize, you know, not only are there, you know, many social, political problems that remain, you know, unaddressed and, you know, really uh, just fundamentally not only not resolved, but really, you know, frustrated and sort yeah. of increased by the system. Uh, but also that, you know, all of this silliness about the idea that this is the system that the Chinese people chose or whatever yeah. is you know, ridiculous. It's sort of just culturalist um, propaganda, you know, of trying course, to yeah. pretend uh, that um, in order to be culturally sensitive, one needs to somehow be sensitive to uh, an oppressive dictatorship. Yeah, right? and and um, and all, like, the, the thievery that goes on from the Chinese people mm. and the corruption and, and the, fir- like, the massive brutality against the Chinese people as well. Like, I mean... Mm. I I'm, I still get um like okay for example this is just another aside sorry about it. Mm. but I I remember like back in December you had the protests that took place in Beijing and and mm. um and in Shanghai mm. where people really bravely took to the streets and some people even chanted down with G- Xi Jinping yeah. and um I remember some of the CCP propagandists on Twitter they go oh well Drew says it's impossible to protest in China well ha 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 we're all la- who's laughing now mm. and then like it comes out yesterday like a UNSW alumni has been arrested by the Chinese government and disappeared for one month. And mm. dozens of these people who protested have been rounded up and disappeared for months. Mm. And they just did that 
in silence. Like they, obviously they didn't do it in front of all the press that were there on that that night. But in the days after, they 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 methodically tracked down everyone who was who was a leader or or, mm. or vocally at, at, vocally active at that protest and disappeared them. Mm. And mm. and what are these people not Chinese? Are these people? I mean, in their narrative, it's the black hand again, and mm. the Westerners have somehow like you know corrupted their brains and. Mm. And th- this is also something we can talk about as well. Like, it's become quite... Like, it's very race-centric, the model in China right, right now. It's, it's very much... Like, got an, it's, it's got the character of an ethnostate, and they, they like to say that anyone who opposes the Chinese government inside China is a race traitor almost. Mm. Maybe, maybe you can talk to us a bit, like... Because it kind of comes into your, like, Han Fu stuff, research. Like, I think a couple months back, was it, was it last year where... There were protests in Paris or something like that, yeah, and yeah. it was it was really bizarre protests where it was like kind of led by Chinese international students or something like that. Mm. And what was it? it? Was it was protesting against one of these big brands? They're saying that they've um, culturally appropriated mm. Han yeah. Fu or something like that. Yeah, 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 and it just became this really like ideologically charged nationalist issue. And mm. just of all the things to protest about, I mean, mm. yeah. forced labor in China, the oppression of Chinese workers, mm. banning trade unions in China. No, they're protesting the Han Fu. I mean, can you maybe go into that a bit? Like, yeah, 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 totally. I mean, my first book was about Han clothing and the Han clothing movement. <laughs> yes. The yeah. Han Fu Yuntong. I, <laughs> I spent uh, a year uh, meeting with uh, enthusiasts of Han clothing in cities across China, Guangzhou, yeah. Shenzhen, all the way out to Chengdu, Kunming, and as far north as uh, Beijing. Right, um, and I <laughs> learned, you know, quite a bit about some of the deeply problematic narratives yeah. that are sort of fueling this movement. Yeah, yeah. Right. The, you know, the idea that um, Han people are oppressed uh, and not oppressed in this narrative by the party. Yeah. But rather you know, oppressed by uh, minorities, right? Oh, okay, like oppressed by Uyghurs and Tibetans and things like that. That is actually a kind of common theme Mm. you get in China today, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's an idea, right, that, um, you know, Uyghurs or Tibetans sort of have it too good with their (laughs) preferential policies. Now, I, I think one has to be you know, quite out of touch with actual reality to believe yeah. this. But, you, wow. you know, there are many people who unfortunately do believe it, right? Um, yeah. And um, well, What's kind of like the basis of their belief? So, like, these groups face genocide as we speak, mm. and yet they feel they've got it too good. Mm. What, yeah, what do you yeah. think is the source of that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's very weak sort of um, evidence yeah. provided, you know? Uh, the idea that... Uh, when a Uyghur or Tibetan, uh, you know, takes the college entrance exam, they get uh, a few extra points. Yeah. Or, you know, 10 yeah. years ago, uh, that one's able to have two children whether the, rather than just one child. Of well, course, you well, know, now, that, that's been now relaxed for everyone. Whereas except, not for Uyghurs. <laughs> yeah, 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 except Uyghurs who are God. now facing, you know... Uh, Birth control policies. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I shouldn't say that birth control policy is a major euphemism, sorry. Um, I mean, you're talking about essentially forcefully inserting IUDs uh, God, into sick. people as a way to sort of suppress populations and population yeah. growth. Um, there was, a, there was mean, a, um, yeah, the yeah. Chinese government's own statistics came out recently and there's been a population growth drop, like a drop in population growth in Xinjiang from... 2017 to 2022, 95% drop in population growth. Mm. And, and they say, well, and the, the CCP propaganda point in relation, I mean, some of the CCP propaganda outlets were like brazenly crowing about it, going, we were able to stop the Uyghur, Uyghur women from becoming baby machines. That's actually what the mm. Chinese, it was one of these consulates in, um, sorry, mm. it was a Chinese consulate in Western America put out a statement like that. Mm. Whereas then there are others who go like, well, the birth rates dropped all across China, so therefore, mm. yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, Going on, um, the whole the whole idea, like, I mean, it's, it seems quite similar to the kind of racist backlash against affirmative action policies in, say, mm. America or yeah. even Australia. Yeah. Yeah, 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 indeed. And yeah, yeah, I mean, the problem, however, is that, you know, when you have those kinds of racist uh, sort of uh, narratives here in America and Australia, you kind of have space for people to you know, push back against that, disagree, you know, argue. Yeah. Um, 
But, you know, the space for that type of uh, critical engagement on these types of issues is uh, increasingly limited in China. Um, and it's even more limited today than it was, you know, uh, 13 years ago when I was doing research there. Yeah. Right? And so as a result, you know, um, it's not only that internet sort of rhetoric is controlled and certain opinions are sort of pushed out of the realm of respectability, but also that really extreme opinions and really sort of, you know, racist, um, you know, uh, even genocidal opinions uh, through that censorship almost become normalized, mm, right? Yeah. And uh, are in, um, you know, many people disagree with these ideas, but you don't have the space to say, you know, hey, stop it with this, you know, racist, Han supremacist uh, nonsense. Yeah. Right? yeah. Can you can you talk to us a bit about, um, like the what you think fuels Han supremacist ideology, and you th- do you think it's a dominant theme in Xi Jinping's China right now? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I do think um, it is a point of major yeah. uh, concern, right? Um, now, what fuels it? Uh, it's quite difficult to say, yeah. right? Um, I think that one explanation uh, that I tried to pursue in my book, uh, The Great Han, was that you know there's a certain gap between the way people imagine China to be, whether whether you know in the past or you know in the present, and kind of the reality of everyday life, right? And so that by sort of pushing the sort of hand supremacist narrative, there's this attempt to kind of close the gap, right? Mm. Like you feel like things aren't that great, but if you just keep saying it's great. We're it's part of the master race. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, that's a that's, pretty classic tactic of all dictatorships. Mm, I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that's what Hitler did with Nazi Germany. That's what mm, Mussolini yeah, did yeah. with fascist Italy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So often this kind of supremacism it grows out of a sort of deep lack of confidence like yeah. uh, an all-encompassing sort of anxiety and you try to sort of yeah. uh you know sort of patch up that anxiety uh with these sort of narratives of greatness um and the problem is that yeah. that, that simply doesn't work you know i mean um yeah. rather than sort of making up these various sort of narratives to say why you're so great, you know, uh, why not sort of cultivate sort of an open uh, democratic society where people can debate ideas freely yeah, and through that process, you know, uh, find new ways to improve society. Right? It's, it's really interesting. I think we've all probably had experience of that kind of um, really weird deep-seated sense of uh, lack that drives a lot of the Chinese ultra-nationalists. I mean, me being a 21-year-old, the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs was literally like... They, they had a... Zap, what was his name? The guy who uh, posted the um, photo of the Australian soldier. is like a cartoon of an Australian oh, soldier yeah, yeah. slitting a throat. Yeah, Zhao yeah. Li Zhang, was it? Yeah, Zhao Li Zhang. Z- Zhao, great guy. Zhao Li Zhang. Like, at an international press conference, for some reason, he was condemning me, a 21-year-old guy who just lived in Brisbane, Australia. Like, why the fuck do they care? It's literally the Chinese government. They're a nuclear-armed superpower. Why the fuck do they care? And then, like, why the fuck do they care about some American ad- academic just walking through Hong Kong at a shopping mall? And, like, yeah. Max's young friends who were teenagers, like, why did they care so much about, you know, these pe- Initially, these were, you know, peaceful protests, and yet they were beginning to torture people and, you know firing people firing at people in the streets and stuff like that like mm. with you know aiming tear gas rounds at people's heads why why is it that deep seed of like deep seated sense of lack and like it's, it's like any criticism of the ccp no matter how small anywhere in the world it's almost like viewed as an existential threat mm. yeah, yeah, yeah 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 there's a real desire to control the discourse yeah. right and yeah. i think i think that grows out of sort of the ccp's Attempts to sort of talk itself up, you know, hey, yeah. we're great, we're the best, right? And then, you know, reality doesn't match up with that, 
but they'd rather sort of uh, threaten and intimidate anybody who points out the truth uh, rather than, you know, doing the real hard work of actually being a decent humanitarian government. Well, it's true. I mean, remember there was that study recently. I think I talked about it with Max on, on the podcast where, like, they were doing a study of the bot networks that were attacking Vicky Shu, mm-hmm. the Australian dissident writer. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they, they found that they did an analysis. And, um, you know, all these attacks were coming from 9 to 5 p.m. Be- Beijing time. And they even had fucking a lunch break. Like, they, they'd gone on smoko. And yeah. it's like, why is this government spending money, literally, like, paying people just to... Like, their 9 to 5 full-time job is just harassing dissidents online. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Instead of spending money on the fact that, you know, lifting Chinese people out of poverty. I mean, mm. it's the great, the great narrative they like to talk up, 800 million lifted out of poverty. But um, that book, Invisible China, and Alex Turnbull put me onto that, mm. and it was like, it was explaining that, like, it was it, like huge numbers, tens of millions of kids in the Chinese rural countryside. And this is still like, it's probably a majority of where Chinese births occur now. Mm. Like, they're, they're growing up with malnutrition. They're growing up with intestinal worms that are sapping their energy going to class. Um, there are like t- some, some crazy stat, like 20 million Chinese children like needed glasses to be able to see the whiteboard in school and they don't have glasses. They just can't actually study that way. Mm. And so you would think they would spend money on this mm. rather than paying people to just literally troll dissidents online. It's insane, the choices that they make. Mm. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Who yeah. knows why they do it? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I, I mean, that's the most, I think, disgraceful part of the whole situation is that, you know, you have a government that does have money to yeah. do what it wants to do, but, you know, it doesn't care about vaccinating older people before they uh, lift, yeah, you know, true. COVID restrictions. Yeah. It doesn't care about, you know, building schools so that... Uh, they don't know, collapse children, on you yeah, during yeah, a fucking earthquake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they don't care about, you know, monitoring um, businesses to ensure that they don't put melamine in children's milk powder. God, yeah. You oh. know, uh, if you can control everything, which is clearly what they aspire, to do. they aspire to do when wow. we're talking about sort of international discourse about the CCP, you know, why can't you control these things, right? Yeah. That's, that's actually such a sick point. This is a totalitarian government that aspires for to- total full control over Chinese society, and yet they don't care that there are some businesses putting, like, lead in mm. children's food. I mean, or what, what are the toxic, toxic yeah. chemicals that they're putting in them? Yeah, 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 yeah. melamine, yeah. yeah. I, I do know that... Um, you know, thousands of children were certainly affected by this. Poisoned, um, yeah, 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 yeah. In the sense of developing kidney stones as God. a result of this. That is um, so horrific. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly, um, I believe that official numbers say that at least hundreds of infants died. God, um, that is sick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's quite sad. Um, and then, you know, that there were. People in the aftermath of that, like uh, Zhao Lian Hai and others, who um, did try to seek uh, justice for their children, um, and they were also, you know, oppressed, right? And hounded, um, and yeah, 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 harassed, you know. And, and I mean, that's again quite sad that. Um, so the government allows a business to poison your child, and then when you try and seek restitution, because they they mm-hmm. claim that they've got this official petition type system, etc. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When you go through the official channels to try and seek restitution, then you're persecuted and harassed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, ha- yeah, harassed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's quite, quite tragic. Um, and, I mean, there's always. I remember back when this broke in two thousand eight. You know, there's always this optimism, right? That, okay, now is the moment that things are going to change, right? Oh, yeah. You know, there's these perpetual crises. Um, well, people are now trying to... There was an article in Financial Times the other... Like, last month going, well, now now get ready for Xi's new term. He's going yeah, yeah, to yeah. be he's gonna be reopening the economy mm. and, and everything's... He's going to lift controls. And mm. yeah, just, yeah. Are you guys kidding? Yeah, I mean, yeah. So there's this endless optimism that there's yeah, there some is. sort of... 
pragmatic, reasonable. It's party. like it's like people who used to go, um, oh, now we will have the serious Trump. Remember, remember, yeah. like back in like twenty sixteen, like like now we'll get the presidential Trump when he gets a, when he gets elected, he goes in, and then five years later, like it, yeah. it's never changing. It's yeah, never changing. Yeah, but. Yeah. yeah. So um, so yeah, yeah. Even now, you know, with the end of zero COVID, of course, you know, people are getting optimistic but um wasn't it crazy these people were protesting for zero covid the chinese government lifts zero covid controls and then arrests the people who were protesting against it yeah 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 yeah. and it's yeah yeah it's hard work uh, and and these people were pessimistic i mean mm. some of these students that got arrested were just saying things that chinese state media literally begun parroting like four days later Mm. because it was such an abrupt change that like Mm. within 24, 48 hours, suddenly all Chinese state media were saying, you know, COVID's safe, it's mm. just the flu, everyone will open up. Mm. And this is, like, the students who just, like, two days before were saying, like, please, people are starving in lockdown apartments. Mm. Then they're arrested. Mm. My God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The constant hypocrisy of it is just maddening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's a tragedy. Like, I, I do hope that um, universities and other institutions in Australia uh, will do, you know, everything that they can um, to stand up and voice their support for people who are being, you know, persecuted in China for something as simple as just saying, hey, maybe don't lock me in my house for three years straight. Yeah, you know, I like mean, actually welding people in. <laughs> yeah, welding yeah. people in. God, I mean, well, well, well so you're, you're obviously um, an academic at Australian University. What's your, what's your kind of... And obviously you're, you're potentially a circumscriber from what you can say Mm. Um, until you got tenure, but like, what's your kind of um, perspective on the kind of how how big do you think the space is for someone to criticize the Chinese government and Australian University? I felt I kind of personally found that it was quite uh, limited this space mm. within which you can operate because mm. I I got thrown out. But yeah, what what do you yeah, feel yeah. when it comes to? Yeah, I mean that's difficult to say. Um, I do think that there are. All types of pressures, yeah. right? Um, there are, I think, peer pressures. Yeah. Right? Um, and I think that's sort of a major element. It's um, a weird thing where... As far as, you know, rather than sort of being pressured at any point by the administration... Yeah. I feel like more often one sort of encounters sort of anxieties from colleagues. Yeah. Exists saying like, oh, you know, Kevin, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? You know, I can talk about, you know, at my old uh, university, Macquarie. um, Oh, yeah. Two situations that I encountered. Uh, One was um, where I did a talk with the... the people from China Uncensored. Oh, uh, yes, yeah. And... And did they go, uh, Falun Gong, blah, blah, blah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, it was me and the guy from China Uncensored and Feng Chong Yi, who teaches at UTS. Yeah. Um, and uh, someone else, but the title of the talk uh, included the word uh, Silent Invasion, which was oh. Clive Hamilton's book. And I, I had a colleague... He got so triggered by just yeah, the title, hey? Yeah, yeah. I had a colleague <laughs> hound me for, you know, participating in a talk. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't understand, you know, why it's inappropriate to join a talk that references, you know, a recent, uh, well-researched you know, thoroughly researched and, um, you know, well-documented book. Well, right? here's why you're wrong, Kevin, because Clive Hamilton was personally reanimating the spirits that led the, um, <laughs> the racial pogroms against Chinese miners on the Victorian goldfields. <laughs> so it's, a, it's actually a 150 to 200 mm. year history there. And that's kind of the mindset that they always take to it. I mean, yeah, yeah. like, like, and, and, like if, if anyone's criticising the Chinese government in, in Australia, mm. well, it must be going all the way back to, mm. you know, the fears that led to white Australia, et cetera, mm. et cetera. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, of course, I won't deny, you know, that there are stupid, racist people, you know. Of course Who do, yeah. you know, target people uh, simply because of their backgrounds, you know, whatever yeah, that background of course. may be. Um, but, you know, there's a certain type of academic who wants to pretend that, you know, some idiot at Woolworths who's yelling, you know, some racist thing at an Asian yeah. person 
like they just read Silent Invasion or something. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. That's not, yeah, it's, that, it's that, insane. That's, isn't not it? what, that's not what's happening. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah like, it's, uh, it's often yeah. times like people who are like <laughs> quite sick, they may be on drugs and things like that. Yeah. And it's like, wow, they sat down read Clive Hamilton's, like, you know, well-researched 250-page book and then decided, okay, I'm going to go to Woolworths and just yell at random Asian people in the yeah, eyes. Yeah. That's so true. I mean, mm. we all know that's how it works. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> you, you know, it, it is important, uh, essential, right, to fight anti-Asian uh, racism, whether in Australia or, you know, America, where I'm yes. from, or anywhere in the world. But, you know, we can't conflate... Uh, necessary and urgent criticism of the CCP with, uh, you know, anti-Asian racism. Um, and this and is unfortunately, what the, that happens just all the time. And it is unfortunately also a narrative that's pushed very hard by the Chinese government because mm-hmm. they worked out it's very effective to silence mm-hmm. discussion. Yeah. So, so I know that like when they wanted to shut down me, the Chinese government had the Global Times say, Drew's leading anti-Asian racial pogroms at the University of Queensland mm-hmm. and he's a racist rioter and things mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. I mean... Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. this is, I mean, yeah. and I'm, they've they call Max a terrorist, and mm. I think yeah. yeah, it was really funny as well. I think uh, one time I was protesting against Gladys Lou, mm-hmm. and um, oh, and yes. then in one of the uh, newspapers that sort of condemned the actions, uh, there's a photo of me throwing cash, mm-hmm. and it's so Renmin B. Yeah, it's it, it, uh, it's a common Hong Kong protest tactic. Uh, I guess it's just a common tactic everywhere. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> true, true. <laughs> but uh, there were two articles. One of them said. Uh, Protest to Drew Pathlu, throwing throwing money at Gladys Lou with my <laughs> face on it. And uh, there was another time when there was the Peng Shui protest. Yeah, yeah. And there was a photo of just literally just me, mm. and then um, Drew behind me, another mate, another volunteer behind me, mm. and then the, the description said three white men uh, <laughs> trying to disrupt the Australian Open games <laughs> in support of Peng Shui and things like that. So that always happens. Yeah, mm. it is. It's, it's, it's sometimes yeah. it's not just the CCP. Like, yeah. It's yeah. Other, well, we I wouldn't say sympathisers, but, you know, people the, that are censoring themselves. The, the other day, um, when Presley, who's a Hong Konger woman, mm-hmm. and she goes to the Australian Open with us, and she decides of her own volition to, like, ask some Chinese tennis players, just really simple, like, one question. Like, they ask... Very simple question. Um, could you say something for Peng Shui? Mm-hmm. Where, where is Peng Shui now? Something mm-hmm. like that. In Mandarin. Because yeah. Presley is a Hong Kong woman who speaks Mandarin. Mm-hmm. And I post up the video because I filmed it. Mm-hmm. And Presley has her own agency as a human being. Mm-hmm. And she is like, she is a Hong Kong woman. She's allowed to, crit- like, what? Anyway, we put up the video and all the comments are like, Drew Pavlu, the white man. Yet, yet another white man, you know, sexually harassing a Chinese woman, Peng Shui, who who just has asked for her own privacy and please leave her alone. It's like the video is of Presley, a Hong Konger woman mm. asking it, but every single response was Drew Pavlu, mm. the white man persecutes Chinese athletes at the Australian Open. Mm. Yeah. And I, I don't understand. I mean, you, we had um, another example where we went down to Tasmania and it was for the election campaign. We joined up with like, it's actually quite a progressive cause. Like we joined up with the Bob Brown Foundation, which was protesting against a Chinese owned mining company that was just trying to rip up pristine ancient Australian rainforests that are like thousands of years old. Mm. And um, Kinzum had a quote in the newspaper where she said, you know, my homeland was invaded by China because she's a Tibetan. Mm-hmm. And it literally was invaded by the People's Liberation Army. And the Tibetan people memorialize it as an invasion and yeah, they still was. consider themselves to be under military occupation. Mm. And... Um, she has this quote, she said, like, you know, my homeland was invaded by China and it's very distressing to see, you know, this kind of economic invasion of Tasmania. That's, that was her quote. And there was an immediate, immediate, like, fervour online by people saying, like, the Australian newspaper is saying there's a Chinese invasion of Tasmania because there's a mining company. And some, like, they're saying, like, it shouldn't matter what whether the mining company is Chinese government owned or, or Australian owned, you know, they're saying it's an invasion, it's race based. And it's like, and, and they were, and because Kinzen was photographed next to me when she, that quote was there, they go, you know, again, it's these white guys who are like, you know, ra- you know, rallying anti Chinese racism based on the a hundred years of white Australia. It's like, she's a Tibetan woman. She's a, literally a refugee. Kinzen was born as a refugee in India. She has never been able to see her homeland. She had, a grandfather that was like basically killed in a t- Chinese prison, mm. and she's allowed to what? She's not allowed. You're you're not have. And it was all like white leftists as well. The base. Well, what's the term in Chinese? Um, mm. They they say it against the white leftists. Basically, 
<laughs> it was all these people who were going like, like tone policing a Tibetan woman and saying, you know, how dare she, you know, but why? She's a Tibetan refugee. She's not allowed to feel that way about the Chinese government. Mm. So it's very interesting. We always get this. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 And, you know, going back to the, the question of ap- academic freedom. Yeah. I could provide another example. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I was sort of redesigning some elements of the, the Chinese studies program at Macquarie. And uh, one class that I proposed was uh, sort of looking at contemporary Chinese society. Yeah. Right? And, uh, you know, uh, we, I called it social issues in contemporary China. We looked yeah. at, you know, gender, sexuality, pollution, yeah. uh, you know, politics, internet cultures, just all yeah, aspects yeah. of uh, contemporary society. So I had, uh, I had a colleague come to me and say, like, um, I saw your new unit proposal. It's very interesting. Looks good. <laughs> So you're you're of course like, oh great, thanks mate, and just walk off. Wonderful. And then they say, but you know, I noticed the name of the class. Social issues <laughs> in contemporary China. It's a little negative. Wow. <laughs> oh my god. And I I thought you know what? Uh, what am I supposed to to call the class? Right? Yeah, you know? <laughs> the circumstances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> what the you hell? Know, positive energy. <laughs> yeah. China. I mean, oh my you know, god! Like, yeah. uh, I mean, you know, I think sociology has a, a history of looking at issues. At, at you know. <laughs> problems that emerge yeah. in society and trying to understand them, right? Yeah. And so I was quite amazed um, oh my you God. Know, <laughs> by, by this person wanting to essentially, you know, rewrite an entire discipline so that, you know, um, from now but, on all China-focused sociology classes will be called, like, uh, Contemporary China's Great Society or something <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. like that, you know? Oh, wow, it's amazing. I mean... What, what is that? This is kind of also weird reverse orientalism type mm. approach where there are some people who s- seem to think that like, because China is mystical, Shangri-La, blah, blah, mm. blah, like how dare we in the West try mm. to criticise it? We cannot know it unless, you know, we have been part of the 5,000 years of civilization, blah, mm. blah, blah. And so if you're not a Chinese citizen, mm. what, how dare you even try and understand or even try and engage with mm. the whatever is happening in China right now. I mean, mm-hmm. and you probably have a account of this too, Max. Yeah, like, yeah. They try yeah. to... over mystify the knowledge of time. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. They try to say that there are unexplainable cultural reasons behind everything. <laughs> you know, some guy's starving and he's asking for food. That's because, you know, he's not being paid enough. But then, mm. no, it's some mystical elements of Chinese culture and mm. stuff like that. And that is supposed to happen. It's the well, way of the country. Yeah, so, like, you can't study it from a sociological perspective yeah. because how dare you try and understand it, Kevin, as mm. a Westerner mm. who has not been formed by the 5,000 years of pristine mm. yeah. history. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, you know, for people who are, you know, living there locally and who, you know, raise their voice against uh, various official abuses, you know, they face uh, disappearance. Yeah, exactly. Time. Again, you know, uh, the entire situation is just an attempt to sort of control all discourse related to China. Um, And that, I think, uh, is not only a disservice to sort of academic research on China and sort of understanding present realities, it's also, you know, a massive disservice to the people of China. Yeah, of course. Um, Insofar as, you know, they're deprived of a space to really... um, confront sort of difficult uh, realities uh, in a, um, you know, open way uh, that could really, you know, begin to sort through uh, some of these problems forced upon them by a a government that they have not chosen, but that uh, claims to be their destiny. Yeah, well, can you explain to us? um, Actually, I have another question. Yeah, yeah. 
like Kevin talked about like peer pressure and stuff. Like yeah, that. yeah, yeah. And mm. certainly, you know, I think Drew and I have met also academics and people that used to be very interested in this topic, Hong Kong and China. Yeah, pretty yeah. critical of it. And once they start getting slanders and you mm. know attacks on them, a lot of them actually have you know activists and the like. They have been discouraged to go down this rabbit hole yeah. further. Mm. Have you had times when you think you know this maybe is a bit much for me? And to stop just general, or maybe try to make things tamer. Have you? Have no, that? I mean, it is a lot of pressure. Yeah, it is. Know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lot of pressure on me. A lot of pressure on my family. But That's what people don't realize. Like they try. Yeah. Sometimes the propagandists go like, "Oh, they're doing it for the great fame and the money that yeah, rushes in." Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. we're filming this in a fucking dingy like <laughs> in my mate's apartment studio, yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, like, yeah. and the pressure that it puts on you. Like Max lost his family. Mm. I've, I've come close to losing loved ones because of the pressure it puts on mm. you and Kevin you've no doubt experienced amazing pressure I mean yeah yeah, yeah it's yeah, not yeah. fun necessarily yeah 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 and and so that's why I get angry you know when people on Twitter uh, talk as if you know being critical of China is like a a good yeah. career move yeah of course it, it's not you know I could uh, right now if I was you know close to the CCP I could have some you know, chair professorship yeah, at that's true. Shandong University or something, true, yeah. getting paid, yeah. uh, you know, ridiculous yeah. amounts of money and, you know, publishing absolute garbage. You yeah, know? holy and, shit, they love that. Like, yeah. look at how many, like, you know, the few Westerners who are willing to do that type of stuff. Like, they just lavish money on them and, like, mm. And they're, they're immediately elevated to just, like, roles of just massive celebrity mm. in China as well. Like, yeah. if you wanted to, like, that is such an easier part. Mm. Holy yeah. shit. Look at the types of people that they pay to tell China's story well. Like, mm. you know, the fucking Daniel Dundras of the world. Mm. Like, yeah. it, it's... If you wanted to make massive amounts of money, go to China and fucking shield for the government. Yeah. It's easier. Yeah. It's much easier. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I think I'm sort of a much higher quality academic. <laughs> than yeah. like, you know, so, like, you know, I, I could do that very well. Right? Yeah, if, uh, I've already, if I'm I all, wanted, I've but, almost uh, internalized all the stupid propaganda points by this point. So like, yeah. like oh, you know, how dare you criticize? Like blah blah blah. Western. Oh, what about this? What about this? Blah. blah what about it? Like you mm. can just. I've already internalized it all. It's mm. easy. I could do it tomorrow in my sleep mm. if I wanted to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there would be, you know, it would be you know very you know economically rewarding. But uh, you know, I'd rather have a soul. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I unfortunately <laughs> have this uh, conscience that uh, <laughs> you know makes me not want to collaborate with uh, genocide machines genocide <laughs> yeah, um, yeah 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 so um, oh, yeah. one of the, one of the biggest red lines is the idea of separating China splitting oh, up yeah. China etc mm, yeah. and and this comes into Hong Kong independence and it's such a massive red line like there are even like for example Human Rights Watch Amnesty International they do great work on China mm. I'm going to see less so, Megan, but uh, we'll, we'll, go, we'll, go on to, we'll go on further. We'll go further. Anyway, anyway. So, but the red line in the sand, like, they won't call Xinjiang. Like, like they have to call Xinjiang Xinjiang. They have mm. to use, like, the Chinese term, new territories. Mm. And they refuse to say, like, Tibet's an occupied territory. And, mm. like, and it's seen that, like, you know, if they, they can criticise the Chinese government, but if they cross the line into separatism, like, you know, that's the moment when you lose all your credibility. Mm. And even in, like, academia, like, you see this in Australia, like, even if you're a critic of the Chinese government, okay, but if you're seen as, like, you know, calling for the overthrow of the CCP, how dare you? Mm. You are immediately a pariah. Mm. You're some kind of crazy out there. So, like, why do you think that red line exists? And you've very, I think you've gleefully kind of, like, jumped over the red line at multiple mm. points, as have I, as have Max. And it, <laughs> it's probably part of it is just, like... If they tell you, you cannot cross this red line, you cannot criticise the, you know, the great Han nation like this, mm. and then you're like, well, okay, I'm, I'm going to. But, like, mm. I mean, you've, you've crossed that red line. Mm. Can you talk to us about, like, why you think separatism is just this, this you know, forbidden zone for even Western mm. critics of the CCP? And, and why it's seen as just so radical? Mm. And, and why you came to Hong Kong independence? And why you think Hong Kong independence is still seen as this outlandish idea in the West? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that's admittedly a, a very, very big question. Yeah, right? sorry. But, uh, I mean, uh, you know, there, there's a, an often quoted saying in uh, sort of China studies that, you know, China is sort of a civilization masquerading as a nation state. Oh, they right? love that one. <laughs> but I think in reality, you know, the current territory of China, I mean, it's an empire masquerading. Yeah. As Basically, a the borders state. of the Qing Dynasty. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the Qing Dynasty was, 
an expansive dynasty uh, yeah. compared to others. Now, uh, the problem is, I mean, the Qing were certainly no Democrats, right? <laughs> but um, they were, uh, I would say, somewhat more decentralized, True. right, than uh, the current uh, Chinese Communist Party uh, regime. Yeah. Um, and so what we have is a sort of regime designed for absolute control over a nation state, attempting to exercise that control over the sort of expanse of an empire. Yeah. Right? And, um, you know, it's it would be already a tragedy, right, um, if uh, this was being uh, forced upon, you know, just people living in what has historically been thought of as China, you know, sort of closer to sort of the East Coast and the Central areas. Yeah. Um, but this sort of all, all encompassing a, uh, attempt at control expands, you know, beyond that space, yeah, of course. right? Into, um, you know, countries that have historically had, you know, their own governments. Uh, whether we're talking about Mongolia or, yeah, in a min- uh, Mongolia. you know, um, uh, East Turkestan, Tibet, um, and including you know, the once, um, I mean, genuinely autonomous region of Hong Kong. Yes. Right? Now, I mean, if we're thinking about sort of the future of China, right, um, if uh, the CCP was gone and there was democratization, obviously that would be a a pleasant step, right? But... The problem is, of course, that there's sort of a broad expanse of the Chinese nation wherein people simply, you know, don't want to be part of this nation, right? So Why should the Uyghurs be forced? Why should the Tibetans be forced? Why should the Hong Kongers be forced? So I feel that any sort of vision of democratization really needs to go hand in hand with... Uh, sort of uh, an attempt, a uh, sort of openness toward self determination and independence uh, for the various nations that are currently, you know, unfortunately, you know, really occupied yeah. um, by uh, the Beijing uh, dictatorship. And and can you maybe go into this as well? Like, like I I was discussing this with Max the other day. Um, there's this kind of myth that. You know, the parts of China proper, for example, mm-hmm. um, where the Chinese government will say, oh, it's 99% Han. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's maybe a local dialect there that's, that they're trying to crush or trying to sideline. Or there may be, you know, an independent culture there that, you know, historically has been brutalised and stomped mm-hmm. out. Like, could you potentially go into that kind of... How, how that process has played out in Chinese history, potentially? Like, how, how these, li- these people have been incorporated into the empire and, mm-hmm. and then they become Han and... Mm-hmm. and yeah, yeah. I mean, we have seen, you know, whether we're talking about Tibet or East Turkestan, you know, uh, I mean, I think what we call, you know, in the West, uh, you know, essentially, I don't know, settler colonialism, population transfers, right? Attempting to sort of integrate uh, these spaces um, into the Chinese nation. Um and, I mean, that's interesting uh, insofar as these regions are presented as sort of naturally Chinese, right? Yeah. But at the same time, you can see that in that kind of transfer, there's also an assumption that, like, well, okay, we sort of can't say this, but we do sort of think of them as not Chinese. Yeah. Right? And sort of think of Han as sort of the sort of soul, sort of authentic Chinese. Right. Yeah, yeah, and so uh, I mean that kind of those kinds of sort of attempts to sort of transform the demographics, um, which yeah. I, I think we see sort of most disturbingly now um, in the area uh, that uh, some people call uh, Xinjiang. Um, you know, this is uh, really uh, a a process of uh, you know colonization. Um, that I think we need to, 
you know, speak honestly about and, um, you know, in speaking honestly, speak out against. Yeah, yeah. Why, why do you think, unf- like, there is some understanding, not enough, but there is some understanding, I guess, for, um, you know, the freedom, like the free Tibet cause in the West. Mm-hmm. Um, probably less, there's much less so, there's much less understanding, I think, in the West for, say, the idea that Uyghurs actually are not just, you know, facing genocide, but they're also an occupied nation. Like, mm. I'd say probably East Turkestan is a lot less kind of mm. known in, among, you mm. know, yeah. people who follow, follow it in, in the West. But um, probably seems out of all the kind of movements that an independent Hong Kong is potentially the, the least kind of, I guess, re- well, I don't know, do you think, Max, like, out, yeah. do you think it is, like, an in, Hong Kong independence is kind of potentially seen as, like, the least... I think I definitely Legi- have yeah. my own biases, but mm. what's increased, like what's especially depressing about Hong Kong independence, I know it's the same for some communities as well, but what's especially uh, depressing about the Hong Kong community and the condition is that it's not just the CCP, uh, pro CC, it's not just the pro CC support, CC, it's not just the pro CCP supporters that are going against the idea of Hong Kong independence, and it's not just mm. you know, the shills that are protecting the sovereignty of China. Yeah. Very often, the idea of Hong Kong independence itself is not widely accepted in the majority Han population in Hong Kong. Yeah. And I feel like that has to do with the national myth of Han itself. Mm. Like, they can't really explain it. Like, when you ask a Han Hong Konger person, you know, why do you care so much about China? Or why do you think Hong Kong is ultimately an, an, uh, an inseparable part of China, even yeah. though you want it to have democracy? They can't really point their finger as to, you know, this is why. But they will yeah. say things like, oh, you know... Uh, my family's from that place ultimately and we yeah. have ties and things like that mm. yeah but, um, yeah yeah, yeah. Th- that's what uh, that's what Eric Tsui's uh, new book uh, yeah. which I'm reading at the moment is yeah. about like looking at why there was this sort of attachment to China for so long like yeah. even in sort of pro-democracy groups yeah. insofar as you know being incorporated into China um, is very much incompatible and with I, Hong Kong's democratization, yeah. of course, yeah. right? Um, yeah. And, and onto that, I think, like, it's probably, I'll get criticized for saying this, but then um, I think racial superiority is really big in Hong Kong, and I don't think enough people realize it, mm. both from the establishment mm-hmm. camp and less so from the pro-democracy camp. But, mm. you know, if you're a Han Hong Konger, you look Chinese, well, what the Chinese government would say is Han Chinese. Mm. If you look like that and you're from, you know, a middle-class social status, you know, there are multiple, many, many cases of just brutal torture and mistreatment of Filipino workers mm-hmm, and true. Indonesian migrant workers and things like that. Mm. You know, Chongqing Mansion, mm. you've heard of it, like things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Immigrant communities that are not predominant East Asian are really yeah. treated badly and are almost second class citizens. Mm. You know, they deny them citizenships, they can't, it's like the immigration policy is even worse than mm. most of the other places of the world. Well, yeah. if you think Nauru is bad, oh, I shouldn't. If you, yeah, oh. like they've got. My point being, Hong Kong's got internment camps for immigrants, but itself and things. God, like. yeah, yeah. So you know, I think the, also the the pride in ethnicity and race, you know, all those sort of elements on top of the culture, that has really solidified the political belief that Hong Kong is ultimately Chinese. Because I think for a lot of, especially the older generations, a lot of their, a lot of their pride, comes from being Chinese. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. 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 But if we look at you know the various nations currently held within uh, China. I think Hong Kong, as uh, when compared to many others, is really sort of the most well-prepared. True. Yeah, Yeah, that's true, probably. You know, I mean, it has its own territory. It has... Really, true. It makes sense. Culture, its own currency, its own, uh, you know, government institutions which true it does have, have current function yeah have unfortunately you know now been taken over by uh, the ccp that's true though um, that there are kind of these local institutions mm. that ostensibly have this kind of autonomous character mm. and of course they have been taken over but i mean it, it could very easily function as an independence mm. yeah i mean yeah. in the same way singapore functions yeah, as an independent yeah, state. yeah. And, and, I, and i think that's why it's so surprising right that sort of yeah the idea of Hong Kong independence was for so long, yeah. you know, treated as this ultimate taboo, yeah. almost. Um, and it's only in, I mean, you know, of course, from 2011 onward, you know, you do have more and more people talking about this. 
But I think it's only in 2019 that you have sort of like real, I mean, mainstreaming, you know, very yeah. much of this idea where um, everyone essentially realized that, well, wow, uh, so long as we are part of China, you know, there's no hope for democratization. There's no hope for even maintenance of the most basic rights that were ostensibly guaranteed yeah. uh, by the basic law. And then yeah. once everybody realized that, the CCP's response was simply to shut everything down yeah. know, with the national security law. Mm. I mean, my sense is that Hong Kong independence among academics, like academics would look down upon the idea of Hong Kong independence. Would you feel like that that's a correct assumption? Yeah, yeah. I mean, people tend to think of it as, you know, a pipe dream, yeah, you know, something yeah. that's uh, implausible. And I mean, you know, when we look at the balance of power at the moment between Hong Kong and China, I can agree that I don't think it's going to happen tomorrow. Yeah, right? yeah. But, you know, any group of people, when sort of fighting for their freedom and fighting for their independence, you know... It takes years, decades, yeah, of course. right? Um, but once that idea, you know... Is out there. Once that idea is out there, you know, there's really no way... To put it back in the bottle. Yeah, yeah, to put it back. And so I think that, you know, although the national security law might have silenced all kinds of political debate in Hong Kong, as I point out in my book, in reality, it proves the arguments of the people who have been silenced, right? Yeah. Insofar as for the past decade, these people have been pointing out political development My with Hong so Kong as part of China, you know, it's not possible. We're not going to have genuine democratization. We're not going to have genuine self-rule. We're not going to have genuine autonomy. And so really the only path forward for Hong Kong to maintain its own culture, to maintain its own political institutions is to become uh, an independent entity. Yeah. I definitely agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think uh, the interesting thing is usually when people say, like especially supporters of the general protest movements who say, you know, Hong Kong independence is impossible and it's unlikely, usually, not all, but usually the counter argument basically is that, you know, then it's more likely or it's better if China as a whole, the People's Republic of China and the Communist Party liberalizes. Mm. Yes, but if you put Hong Kong independence and the liberalization of the CCP on a scale, you can't really say, you know, one's <laughs> yeah. more likely than the, than the other. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, sure. yeah, 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 indeed. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah, as I mentioned, you know, even any liberalization of the CCP, you know, if uh, you basically just create sort of a democratic, ostensibly democratic community uh, that nevertheless includes, you know, many nations who don't necessarily want to be part of that community. Yeah. Uh, then it's not truly democratic, which is why, yeah, yeah, there needs to be both uh, democratization and uh, opportunities for uh, self-determination. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we just do the last five minutes, but do you think there's any, like, really good question we should get to? Like, I'm just trying to think, like, <laughs> your, your take that, like, China should be, should actually be separated. Like, should maybe, should we go into that? Maybe, like... The balkanization of China. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, we could, if we really wanted to get this podcast right, we could just call it, like, the case for separatism in China. Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. I don't know, like, but, like, I don't know, like... So I have actually heard yeah, from yeah. pro, like, even in the recent A4 revolution mm -hmm. movement, I've heard of many Chinese dissidents from China who have the arguments of the balkanization of China. Oh, it's interesting. Better off, yeah. It's not like they're from Hong Kong or any traditionally separatist-leaning sort of state in yeah, China. Yeah, it's interesting. They can be from, like, I remember one of them is from the Tuja tribe. Mm. And, um, oh, okay. Near, I think, Hunan and Hubei, which is like China proper. Mm. And even them, they're saying, you know, the country should be balkanized for a better mm. opportunity for all of us. That's mm. very interesting. Uh, like, I also encountered people in Brisbane from the A4 revolution, like, who, like, the majority of the crowd were chanting down with Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping's yeah. the devil. Like, they were really yeah. radical young students. And I, I actually went up and talked to some of these young students and the ones that were most radical had actually been in mainland China just mm. up until a few months ago. So they'd mm. lived under it. And um, it's a really interesting phenomenon where I saw that 
like some of, some of the people in the crowd who actually tried to push back against those who were saying like down with Xi Jinping, down with the CCP. They were saying, this is just about COVID zero. This is just about COVID zero. Like I went up to those people after and I tried to talk to them mm. and like it seemed that they were actually potentially like established migrants in Australia who'd been here for a long time, hadn't lived under Xi Jinping. It's really interesting. And, and yeah, they was trying to say like, they saw some Hong Kongers and they're like, we don't want to be associated with that. Mm. It's very much this kind of mixed bag. Mm. But um, yeah. I don't, Kevin, give us the case if you really, just, just to really piss off the CCP supporters, <laughs> give us the case for separatism in China, how it actually might benefit the people in under, mm. under you know, who are being oppressed in China right now. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's <laughs> a, a big question, right? But, uh, you know, I think that in China, um, in sort of China proper, and in sort of the various sort of, occupied uh, territories, uh, I think that there's, you know, so much unrealized creative potential. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, uh, there was a gradual push to decentralization from, you know, the 1980s onward, but we've seen a real backlash against that Mm -hmm. under the new dictator, uh, Xi Jinping. So, uh, I think that, uh, you know, the problem is that there is this sort of centralizing, control-obsessed mindset yeah. um, that, you know, certainly existed under Mao. Um, mm-hmm. And there was an attempt to sort of step away from that. But... It, it it comes back, you know, and sort of having all of that power over everything from Beijing, right? That's just going to emerge, I, I fear, you know, again and again and again, right? And so I think that, you know, the best way to handle this is to recognize that, you know, China is sort of an empire with multiple distinct cultures, languages and multiple distinct nations um, within its current borders and to simply give the people of those various nations the opportunity to uh, determine their own futures uh, free from interference uh, from you know the old men of Beijing yeah Um, I think that you know there's really a lot of potential right, uh, for really exciting new developments. And, you know, the CCP likes to say that, oh, well, you know, the collapse of the CCP, uh, it would be chaotic, you know, it would be a mess, everything would fall apart. But sometimes I think, you know, things do need to fall apart in order to be rebuilt. Right? True. Could you... Could so- you- could you address maybe the argument that they might say they might bring up is look at say the Soviet Union and then look at the former territories of the Soviet Union in the nineties mm. where it was just thievery mm. vultures picking over the bones of the state oligarchs stealing everything mm. armed gun battles in the streets the mm. civil wars how is there a path to to avoiding that type of utter chaos and destruction while also you know pursuing a path of freedom for the people of China and all the oppressed nations within. Mm. I mean, this is the million-dollar question. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, the 1990s were not an easy period, right, for various post-Soviet nations. Yeah. However, were they better than the 1980s, right? Would we be better off, right, if the Soviet Union still existed? Oh, well, that's obviously a very tough question. I I don't think so, right? And so, um, I mean, uh, how shall I say it? Like, um... The CCP often talks about, you know, this chaos, right, that would emerge from sort of uh, the collapse of the system. But they feed that chaos by locking Mm. up any opposition that forms, right? Try to destroy all civil society groups. Yeah, yeah. There are intellectuals, there are human rights lawyers, you know, various people who... People who could build a a different society. ...play, like, a real positive role in China's future. Yeah. And they're talented, intelligent people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, uh, 
how shall I say it? I mean, it, it would almost be like me... I'm trying to think of an example yeah. that would, uh, uh, you know, match this kind of situation. But basically, uh, you know, you're saying like, oh, you know, don't open the refrigerator door, right? Yeah. Because uh, if you open the refrigerator door, everything's going to fall out. <laughs> but while I'm doing that, I just keep throwing things <laughs> yeah. in the refrigerator. Yeah, this it's just is, shaking it violently, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is a really stupid metaphor. It, no, but it, 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 it doesn't make sense, though. It, it's just because I, I actually have, like, a really messy refrigerator at home that has way too <laughs> many things in it, and so it was the first thing that I thought of, right? <laughs> but, like, uh, you know, you can't constantly warn against something while creating the conditions in which that something will happen. Right? Well, remember, and so, you know yeah. the slogan of Assad in Syria? Like, the Assad is scrawled on the wall of burned cities, you know, Assad, we burn the country. And that's mm. the CCP's model. And mm. It's also, like, kind of the Putinist model. Mm. Like, yeah, yeah. like if, if they can't have power, they'll destroy everything. And, mm. and yeah. what, can you let the fucking terrorists, you know, hold everyone hostage like that mm. forever? Yeah, mean, yeah, 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 yeah. And that's, you know, I mean, that's the real situation. I mean, you know... Both, uh, you know, the people of China, you know, the peoples of East Turkestan, Tibet, Mongolia, Hong Kong, and the world. Yeah. You know, many of us are, I think, you know, genuinely being held hostage uh, by yeah. sort of a regime um, that, you know, not only does not respect, but is openly hostile to, you know, basic human rights, including the right to free speech and the right yeah. uh, to self-determination. Right? And people, people try and say it's like, well, at least it's not like a missionary regime. At least it's not trying to like, you know, overturn governments and, and mm. erect a government in its own image. But, but mm. the, kind of the, it's almost like the universal premise of the CCP though is like, they have to silence opposition abroad and speech abroad mm. because unless they're able to make a world where, you know, opposition to the CCP is destroyed and it's mm. it's eliminated. Mm. They will always see a threat. They've mm. got this universal yeah, conception yeah. of the threat. So yeah, 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 yeah. And the CCP it has overthrown the yeah. Tibetan government. Yeah, it true. has essentially overthrown the Hong Kong government. True. And it aspires to overthrow the Taiwanese government um, yeah. because, you know, the success, you know, the greatness of Taiwan, um, is you know, in many senses, an insult uh, yeah. to uh, the CCP. Very much like the existence of an independent Ukraine is an insult to, like, the failings of the Putin regime mm. in Russia. Mm. Yeah. If you've got a sclerotic yeah. regime that's mm. falling apart at home mm. and there's an example of an open free society that, that you know, shares the same culture and languages, mm. like, they have to destroy it. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I do think, you know, that um, I've been, uh, you know, encouraged by uh, the global response to the current situation in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, yeah. it's also great yeah. well, what you guys have, have done, uh, yeah. you know, on that well, cause, right? Thank you, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I there's a shared link there. Yeah, yeah, I think that people, uh, you know, I think most people have abandoned their illusions about yeah. Putin at this point. But we need to also abandon all illusions about uh, Xi Jinping and the yeah. CCP. Um, well, look, you know, it, it, there's, a, there's a reason that uh, these two leaders are yeah. buddy buddy allies. Oh, of course. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, actually, if you don't mind, we'll just add one more question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, Kevin. I, yeah, I no. Oh, I, I gotta go soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry, sorry. Because uh, some people say, like, especially critics of the Chinese government, even, uh -huh. um, they say, you know, it's all Xi Jinping's fault. Like, it was better before Xi Jinping. Mm. And if, if we have another leader, mm. then perhaps things would be different. Do you mm. think, ultimately, yeah. is that... It's a good question. It's, it's more of a Xi Jinping problem, or if mm. it's, like, a problem that will never end? No, yeah, yeah, no, no. I, I, or what yeah. do you have to say to these people? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, it's a good one, it's a good yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, that's a great question. And, you know, when I watch, sort of, China, when I read China yeah. analysis, right, mm. I always think to myself, oh... Hope springs eternal. Right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> Everybody hopes that, oh, yeah. this is the sign of the next great opening. Oh, my um, God, yeah. But, you yeah. know, the, the, that's simply not the case. Um, uh, if we look at sort of the 
development of the CCP, you know, there were genuine attempts at real liberalization in the 80s. Obviously, it didn't go far enough. And um, yeah. we had 1989. Yeah. Every generation of leaders after that has been more hardline yeah, than the yeah. previous, right? Um, so It's insane that ev- people thought, like, Hugh Tao was liberal or, yeah, or whatever yeah. it was. Every time people hope, like, oh, here comes the great reformer, right? Yeah. People yeah. said this about Xi Jinping. You know, Chun Zemin, <laughs> oh, the yeah, great yeah. reformer, Chun Zemin. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not going to embarrass people by naming yeah. names, <laughs> you know, but everybody wants to say this. Yeah. But basically what we've seen is, as sort of... Chinese society grows increasingly dynamic and complex, you know, the internet, yeah. you know, um, sort of all types of new developments, the government wants to exercise ever greater control, yeah. right, over everything, right? Everything. It's, it's anxious uh, about these new developments. So certainly Xi Jinping is a worse person than Hu Jintao. I, yeah. you know, I could say yeah. that without any reservation. Yeah. But he's not an anomaly. Exactly. He's uh, continuing the legacy that was built up from Jiang Zemin through Hu Jintao uh, into Xi Jinping. You know? And we can see you know, the sentencing of Liu Xiaobo. Yeah, you know? yeah. When did that happen? That yeah. was under Hu Jintao. And they let him die in prison. Yeah, yeah. The Jasmine Revolution crackdown. You know, that I, you know, witnessed uh, relatively firsthand. Yeah. You know? Who did that? That wasn't Xi Jinping. That was Hu Jintao, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I mean, uh, Xi Jinping is sort of the, I don't know, Rick DeSantis to uh, <laughs> sort of Hu Jintao's Donald Trump, right? You know, sort yeah. of um, just taking it a just further I yeah rationalizing yeah. it or, or yeah. making the system more logical yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah gee oh there's so many more questions i want to ask but but next time yeah, yeah. next time we'll, we'll have you on again kevin yeah, yeah. make sure we to buy two country two systems it is actually an excellent book thank yeah. you kevin for yeah, coming yeah, on yeah. kevin yeah. and um we will continue to spread um this evil message uh <laughs> of, of freedom and democracy further and further thank you so thank much you. kevin yeah. thank you for listening beautiful yeah, beautiful